Hi, I'm Ron Kubitz here today at the 65th Annual PHRA Conference. Uh, proud to represent the PHRA and proud to be here with Marcia Jones. Uh, she is the Chief Diversity Officer for PI PNC Financial Services Group. Nice to have you here today. Nice. Thank you very much for having uh, me. Oh, it was our pleasure. She just did an excellent uh, keynote presentation on inclusion and diversity. So we're going to talk a little bit about that and get to know her a little bit here in the next few moments. Now, as I said, you are the Chief Diversity Officer for PNC Financial Group. How has your role changed over the years? As obviously there's been a lot of change with that topic. Well, certainly, uh, although I'm the first Chief Diversity Officer for PNC, uh, PNC has been uh, focused on diversity for a number of years, even before I uh, joined the organization in 2009. Uh, diversity is, in fact, one of our eight core values. Um, but as the first Chief Diversity Officer, I had the opportunity of, of being able to first take an analysis of what diversity initiatives were taking place within the organization, then to be able to link them and to put a strategy together for us uh, moving forward. Um, we believe that there is, uh, if you would, six milestones in our strategy to uh, integrate uh, diversity and inclusion uh, into our uh, core. And uh, we are on that journey. Every organization has uh, its own journey. Uh, and so my uh, experience over the last couple of years has been as uh, the um, strategy evolves that uh, each year we then take uh, another step along the way. Great. Now in your presentation you talk about intent versus impact. Mm -hmm. And obviously there are a lot of challenges as you mentioned. How do you get some of those executive leaders from that level of intent to where they're actually making an impact and overcoming some of their internal corporate challenges? Well, the first thing is that uh, you have to have the buy-in from the uh, not only the chief executive but also from the, uh, his executive team. And they have to feel very comfortable with what uh, the, the content of the strategy actually is. They have to understand and buy in, if you would, to uh, the rationale, the business strategy. And they have to feel comfortable in terms of being able to articulate it because, uh, you know, as we all know, um, they, um, their actions are imitated throughout the organization. So if they speak about it, and if that then sends the message that it is an important concept within the corporation, then those that are in mid and upper uh, level management will also understand the importance of it and will find ways to be able to make things happen. But you mentioned also here, and you mentioned in your presentation, the importance of education, educating workforce, educating the different uh, facets of the organization. Um, you actually started at PNC a uh, culture of inclusion, part of your educational process. Right. Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, the culture of inclusion process is one which uh, enables us to be able to, first of all, understand what the definition of, of diversity as well as inclusion is at PNC. Um, inclusion at PNC is the full engagement of all of our employees. Why? Because we believe that when our employees are fully engaged, that they in fact will become more profitable, more productive, and therefore ultimately lead to a greater profitability for the entire organization. So when we talk about culture of inclusion, we talk about what are some of those factors that make employees comfortable? Why do they feel that they're in an inclusive culture? And one of the first steps really is um, for us to, or for them to be able to feel that they're able to express their opinions and that their opinions will be respected. They will not necessarily be accepted by the group, but they feel comfortable that they are actually going to be respected. And then over time, uh, those, cur those kernels of, um, of insight, if you would, those uh, ideas, then ultimately lead towards innovation when uh, individuals feel that they are comfortable to bring their entire selves and all of their ideas to work. Okay, so obviously there's a lot of facets, there's a lot of layers to this. Absolutely. Um, I, this is just something I actually thought of from your presentation. You talk about in 2050 that the, major, the majority will be the minority. Mm -hmm. So when you look down the road to 2050, when that happens, do you think that the problems will start becoming reversed or do you think that things will start hitting more of a normality or a status quo? Well, certainly there will be a number of, uh, the demographics will change, all right? But the question that we have is that, well, let's just take right now, for example, we have 50% uh, of women that are graduating um, university, but they are not necessarily uh, representative in mid-level ranks or in upper-level ranks, and that's, you know, that's right now in 2013. Um, what does have to happen when 
con concurrently with this change of demographic is that individuals and corporations have to create this kind of an inclusive culture where everyone has to recognize the fact that there needs to be this ability for individuals at all levels to be able to progress up through various organizations and that there be the a true meritocracy that is built free of unconscious bias mm -hmm. that enables these corporations to really have the best individuals sitting at key levels so that the organizations can be as effective as they can be. Yeah. And you bring up that unconscious bias and you talked about that in your presentation. So you've been called a trailblazer, you've won numerous awards for the, the great work that you've done. What in your upbringing caused you to really become so passionate about change management? From the time that I was in elementary school, Brian, I recognized that there were opportunities uh, for equality that uh, were not, that needed to take advantage of. So as an example, uh, we had a safety crossing guard team. There were no women on the team. And so I went to the teacher that was responsible for it and said, I want to be on the safety guard. And I was, and interestingly enough, uh, I started out that year as a sergeant. By the end of June, I was a captain, and you know it kind of went on from there. There were um, situations where um, I was in uh, a choir at church. The the boy choir got paid. The girl choir didn't. Well, we went on strike. We got paid. <laughs> okay. So in each situation throughout my life, there have been situations where we would find. Um, opportunities to kind of make a difference, see things that needed to uh, be changed, and then you kind of take action on that. And so it, it's continued. Well, great. Uh, well, I certainly respect your time, so we'll end this with uh, one final question. We were talking a little bit off record here about fantasy football, so can you attribute, I hear you're in first place in, uh, in your league, what are some of your uh, tenants for success? Well, <laughs> um, as I, uh, I shared with you before, I uh, look at my uh, roster and I treat it like a stock portfolio. So we look at it on a regular basis. Obviously, there's some weeks that uh, the uh, players have bye weeks, so I have an opportunity to be able to change some players within the portfolio, but um, I, I will tell you honestly, it's been a random walk and it's been through the computer, so <laughs> I'll you're attribute doing, it to that. You're doing better than I'm doing in my league, so I might have to try to uh, get some ideas. But on. I'll take it anyway. <laughs> yeah, so, Marsh, we certainly appreciate your time. Thank and you again, so thank much, you for Ron. the great presentation here at the PHRA. Thank you. Thank you very much.